the Endurance Asia podcast. And always tell the truthful story if they ever ask. Stop the complaining because things ain't that bad. Cool. Ben, Ben Dornan, welcome to the Endurance Asia podcast. Thank you. It's, Excited uh, to be here. Yeah, no, it's really good to have you on. We're here in uh, in Melbourne in a, a, a chilly autumn e- evening in Melbourne, and uh, and yeah, it was good to get a chance to to come and chat with you. You're you're fresh off uh, uh, a race in uh, in India just a, a week or so ago. Yeah, I wouldn't say fresh off it, <laughs> but yes, definitely, I've just come back from India, so um, still feeling a little bit of the effects of it. But. Yeah, re- recovering. <laughs> Um, recovering from uh, the exploits in Expedition India. So I, I was really keen to, to catch up with you because uh, as one of the top endurance athletes and, and adventure racing athletes in in Australia, um, I really wanted to, to f- you know, bring you on and, and get you to share what's happening in the ad- adventure racing world uh, across the region, across Asia Pacific. I know that you've obviously just got back from India, but interested to hear if you'll be out in Sri Lanka in the World Series coming up and uh, and really to find out the, your background as well, uh, how you've come into, to get into the to the sport. So, uh, so yeah, with that, like wh- where did it all come from? Like how, how did you manage to sort of get into the adventure racing world? I reckon uh, I sort of got into adventure racing maybe five or six years ago. Um, I've sort of come from my background just at school and uni days was just doing a bit of everything and and anything, lots of sports, lots of team sports. Um, And then I would play a lot of touch footy and always ran and was always up for a challenge. I think I'd done a few Oxfam trail walkers. Um, You did the, there's one in Melbourne? Yeah, I did that about four times. I did one in London when I was over there traveling. Um, so Is just that the South Downs Way. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 that was pretty cool. So I've often done that in a female team and done pretty well, and just always up for a challenge. And I think I came back from overseas, like working in London and France, um, in about 2009, and got into triathlon and did a fair bit of uh, triathlon. Uh, went to sort of Ironman, but one of the races that came up sort of during while I was doing a bit of triathlon was the Marysville to Melbourne race, yes. which yeah. was a flat water kayak at the end, which I'd done a lot of kayaking for the Murray Marathon, sort of in my uni or uni days and when I was working. Um, so that's a, like a kayaking, long kayaking race. So What's had the f- distance of that? The Murray Marathon's a 404 kilometre kayak over four or five days. So but normally it was between Boxing Day and New Year's. Got you. When I was doing it. So you could do it in a team or a relay. So I did that and for years and you can do the whole it, thing. So yeah, you just have a set distance each day. Um, which makes it sound really easy now that you sort of go all night, but it was still quite challenging at the time uh, to be paddling those those sort of distances. Um, just in a real social type team, we did it in a relay, and then we did it um, a few times a full distance, sort of, which was good. Um, so yeah, the Mrs. Marysville to Melbourne race had a trail run, had a road bike, which I'd sort of had from triathlon and a, a flat water kayak, and I was like, oh, that's perfect for me. I think it was ending up being about a nine hour day and so yeah my sister Elizabeth and I both did this race not knowing anything much about it and we actually did really well and came one two I think in this race oh wow and then at the end so at the end of this race there was a few people that were supposed to beat us who were favorites or whatever but I met a lot of the adventure racing crowd because not many of the triathlon crowd do kayaking yeah so they were kind of around and we sort of made a name for ourselves I suppose in that and they're like you should you should do these adventure races or you know come down and do I think the lawn adventure fest was on that time so we sort of got a mountain bike and went into that and turned up to a what I really remember was turned up to a kayaking session with Jared Kohler of Peak Adventure and he'd just come back from all these races in China and some of these expeditions and he was talking about all these weird crazy races where they went all night and did you know crazy stuff and I was just thinking wow if I hang out with him long enough I could do that that sounds really cool like you know that that switch in my brain that obviously makes me a good endurance athlete that thinks more pain is actually a good thing or like sounds cool as opposed to you know running during it's running to it rather than running away from it it's something that oh, I want to do that yeah and so um yeah I think you know, you fast forward a year later and I've been to China and raced with him and, you know, just got into adventure racing from that. So 
I tried to mix, I did mix like Ironman and adventure racing for quite a bit yeah. and still do, but less Ironmans of late because the, the expedition racing just takes up so much more time, yeah. um, both for leave, but also for training. So probably doing more adventure racing than the Ironman at the moment. But so you said you got back from the UK 2009. Yeah. yeah. So I was over at there for about four years. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. But where, did, where were you? Were you in uh, London? Yeah, or? I worked in London um, for a couple of years and then did three seasons in France on the ski slopes. So oh. it was it was a wonderful life. <laughs> <laughs> Just living it up. I think I definitely, I think dream. I travelled just about as much as I worked or more than I worked. So oh, it was a great time. Yeah, great must time, like yeah. doing a ski season, let alone three Oh, years no, so I did well. one and thought, oh, like, I, yeah, that was pretty good. Let's do it again. So, yeah, <laughs> ended up doing three. Had a ball. And then when you got back to Australia in 2009, you that's when you got into triathlons. Yeah, I just sort of, I'd done a couple with some corporate triathlons. Um, I think I, yeah, got a road bike so I could do a f- the, the little the Gatorade series and the um, Active Tri series, um, just the local races around here, and sort of started to do a little bit better. Um, you know, from couldn't didn't swim that well to start with, so I used to come out sort of back mid to back and then ride past a few and run past a few more. Um, but as you know, got a bike and then hooked up with uh, coach Julie Teddy, um, started to do it better and started to podium and started to, to maybe even win some of these little races. So I think then I was hooked. You yeah. Know. W- when was your first Ironman? Then? Uh, 2013. Okay. So you had a few years one. doing just like Olympic yeah, distance. Yeah. Yep. Just sort of building it up. And then I did a couple of half Ironmans. Um, I think Falls Creek was the first half Ironman I did. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe in 2000 and 11 or t- yeah probably yeah. but yeah the Melbourne Ironman was on in the first was on in 2012 I think and I along with my tri squad were there just at an aid station helping out yeah. and we watched you know from the very first elite runners to the very back of the field watched them all come through our aid station at about 30 k's or something and yeah my coach was there and my sister was there and we we're all looking at each other going you're going to do this, aren't you? Yep. And just like <laughs> signed up the next day or whatever. Like that was it. It was, you knew it was going to happen eventually, but uh, that kind of probably fast tracked it a bit. Yeah, it's fine. I haven't actually uh, done many aid stations or stuff at races, but I, but I think it's a really good thing to do, isn't it? Just yeah. to be able to watch people, watch that they do going through transitions. Oh, absolutely. And I've um, support crewed for a lot of different races and helped out aid stations or followed teams, you know, at, Oxfams or various, you know, supported yeah. races, and it's, oh, it's the best fun. Like yeah. it's, um, you get the excitement and the um, energy from everyone racing, and it doesn't hurt as much. Yeah. Um, and you can, you know, you know what they need because you've done it before. So it's, um, yeah, it's very motivating and exciting. You know, and I think it's a natural pathway that a lot of support crew is doing up doing the race you know, the next yeah. year or, or at some stage because they do see it and get caught up in it. And then you've got a bit of a feel for what you need to do Yeah, as yeah. Well. And so then you sign up for the following year, the 2013 Melbourne yeah. Ironman. Yeah. And how did you get on? Yeah, not bad. Look, I was super nervous um, for the whole lead up. Just, you know, I'd run a couple of marathons and they were hard. Like, you know, they are hard um, running a flat marathon and I just couldn't get in my head going I'm gonna run a marathon after I've ridden 180 k's and had a swim like man this is that's not gonna be fun. How did you get on your marathons when Um, you were doing did you do like Melbourne or? Yeah I did Melbourne a few times look that was um yeah I've had some good ones I would love to do another marathon now because I haven't done one as when I've sort of been more trained I suppose I've sort of given them a crack myself and I think you know. It's weird with marathons because I think everyone thinks that when you say you do ultra running or doing that I watch you they say like what's your marathon time yeah. and as it's almost like the benchmark yeah of like that's the litmus test of how good but yeah I, I've never run one and actually I I don't want one because of that yeah because, of, because most of the ultras that you would run I, I do they're you know they're lumpy the time has no relevance yep, absolutely. really because it's completely different same as an adventure race it has no they're never the same course yeah although ultra marathons are but um 
yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of put off with marathon, but I'd, I'd like to just train for one for like six months and just like to smash out like a, a sub three yeah. and, then, and then go, right, never again. But Yeah, um, I think that's, you know, I was again sort of talking with my sister and both of us are keen. We've got to probably run a marathon if we want to do a marathon and do it well, you know, aim for that sub three. Um, it's probably got to be soon before we start slowing down. I've probably got a few yeah. years left yet, but you know, the there's going to be a point racing, where you start to slow down. Like a lot of the top elite adventure racers, like they're in their forties, yeah, and they're you can like race 50, with, and you yeah. can race until you're well yeah. into your fifties. Yeah, like my and race they race the, well and quick. Some of the guys, yeah. I'm like, oh well, I've got I've got ten years to be as quick as you, but geez, like they go they go well. Yeah, so. but I do think with a marathon, like in. That in a strange way, I'd almost rather do an ultra marathon or a hundred kilometer race um, with less training than I would a marathon. You know, a marathon, yeah. I think you do need that real specific, dedicated training. You know, hit the, the road for work, long and the journey. speed um, to really to give it a good crack. Yeah. I think the beauty of a lot often of adventure racing is that you can do a lot of different training and it's all going to help because you don't really know what you expect and a lot of it's mental as well of yeah. training that's just the unexpected and expecting that yeah. um, so in some ways you know the ultra marathons you kind of think a lot of it's you just got to grit through it and just keep going but it's okay to stop and walk up a hill if yeah. you need whereas in a marathon you wouldn't want to be doing that so yeah, i don't know yeah. in some strange way so so that first iron man then you uh yeah you've done a you've done a few uh marathons leading up to it and thinking like putting that yeah. book ending like the ride and uh the swim and ride after that is going to be torture but, yeah. uh, but how did it play oh, look, out i had a book i did really well. the 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 swim was absolutely horrendous um in that it was the conditions were like a washing machine and they'd shortened it for that year to a like I think it was about 1.5 yeah down in Frankston and they just had um super like it was a washing machine so we took off and you'd ride the top of this wave and you'd almost be airborne and land on the competitors that were underneath you and then you'd have competitors landing on top of you so it was a bit of a a scrap it was hilariously funny but it was like the conditions were pretty average um and then yeah when they shortened it what did they shorten it down to um they shortened it down maybe I think it was one and a half k's or two and there was like just sort of turning around a boy which moved a bit and there were some people that cut like turned early i think so it was a bit got a bit messy um but yeah look the ride was pretty solid nothing went wrong just sort of kept going and it was i did actually enjoy the run um my dad was came like it was in Melbourne, so we had yeah. all family and friends and acquaintances all the way around. You know, being in your hometown, so that was amazing. Um, and I think my dad came and saw me, I don't know, maybe ten k's into the run, and he, you know, I'd obviously been talking to him about it, going, "Oh, like I don't want to run a marathon after 180 k's, like that's gonna hurt." And he kind of saw me, and he's like, "Oh, you're you're looking all right. Do you, do you feel as good as you look?" I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I kind of feel all right now. Like, well, no, I probably shouldn't, but yeah, no, I feel all right. So, yeah, it certainly. Um, Did he say, well, like, crack on? No, he was just <laughs> a little sort of surprised, which yeah, I yeah. suppose I was as well in what I had yeah. thought it would be. And it is, you know, it's a different pace that you're running. You get that nice Iron Man shuffle going, and, yeah. you know, that consistent pace that you're aiming for, it just gradual fade. Yeah. Um, was your da- was your dad into enjoy because I know that obviously you and your sister are absolute guns like we're, we're oh no I know he got you into tennis when you were yeah, young. yeah my yeah. dad sort of um he's probably the sportsman of like my mum certainly isn't I'm sure my mum was one of those um people that would have got notes to get out of PE yeah. when she was at school <laughs> she's you know not an athletic she, she didn't necessarily enjoy that um my dad swam a bit and played played footy um he plays you know he plays a bit of golf he plays a lot of golf now yeah. um and a bit of tennis and mum mum does play tennis um yeah. now and but they weren't like forcing things. you into it they no, weren't like dragging I think, you down um we play we just from an early age did little athletics and yeah. tennis and netball um to keep ourselves active and i think burn off lots of energy so my yeah. sister and i um we were very competitive against each other and probably kept us each ourselves motivated. Yeah, and um, just the two of you. Got my no younger siblings. sister, um, she did a little bit of sport at school. She's definitely not yeah. um, as sporty as we are, and probably yeah. to carve out a you know a difference 
from her t- older twin sisters. She's definitely into the music and um, languages a lot more than yeah. than my sister and I, who are definitely into sports. Yeah. Um, and my brother, he's um, eight years younger than me. He, I think, in any other family would be considered very sporty. But, he kind of, um, <laughs> but, that, but he's the run to the litter in your... <laughs> yeah, but he certainly... So he certainly does a bit of sports and he's done his, you know, fair share of Oxfams and yeah. um, has given a few challenges and cracks. So he, yeah, he, yeah. he'd he give it a go. So yeah, I think in any other family, he'd be considered quite sporty, <laughs> but he, he probably still gets overlooked a little bit with my sister and I, with Elizabeth and I, so... So that yeah. two thirty two uh, twenty thirteen Ironman. So you you got a uh, you placed in the, uh, your age group. For that oh, year? I think I oh from memory might have been about seventh or something. Okay. I think my sister. Well, that was the other thing. She beat me, so you know was I she did really the well. Same one so we both raced that one. That was okay, both our so first that wasn't one. You, so you qualified for Kona then? No, we qualified. Um, both of us qualified. For, so she qualified from that one in Melbourne. Yeah. I think she might have been fifth or fourth or something, and I was just behind her. Yeah. Um, which you're doesn't like matter brown, how doesn't like matter how good it is. It doesn't matter how good you go. Yeah. In an Ironman, and I loved it. It was my first one, but everyone's straight away was like, "Oh, but your sister beat you." I'm like, "Oh, yeah, she did, but I, <laughs> I still had a good race." But it's like that same thing. It doesn't matter if I come second last in a race. If she's last, it's a great race. Like <laughs> you know. <laughs> The amount of times we've had like whiplash just trying to check, is she behind me? She's still behind me? Is she coming? Is she That's catching me? Such like, an interesting oh, dichotomy because just... I'm sure like you make each other better for sure. Yeah. That competitive, like I, com- the competitiveness does make people better regardless, whether it's the business yeah. world, whether it's personal, whether it's racing. Uh, and uh, yeah, it just makes me think of the, the, uh, the Brownlee brothers as well, although they're not obviously twins, but yeah. they're... Um, uh, there's that that really iconic moment where um, Alistair picks up the yeah. younger one when he just like hit the wall through dehydration yeah. and dragged him over the line. And uh, have you guys had any of those situations in the two? Are you racing against each other? Uh, where you're like, or would you be like, Fucker, I'm gone. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> well, like you that. should have drunk some water, Elizabeth. I'm off. Yeah, <laughs> you would have done the cursory. Oh, are you all right? Oh, well, see ya. Um, well, probably in that Marysville to Melbourne race, we've done it a few years. And I think w- when it was running, the three years that it did, I think, um, we sort of raced around each other together for most of the race. Um, and then in the kayak, I think the first year she beat me because I'd fallen out in the kayak and she came past. And the second year I did the same, like it was the opposite that she ca- she fell out and I went past. So it's yeah. like, that. oh, I'd help if I could, but I can't. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. Oh, sorry. So... Yeah, I th- whack them with your paddle <laughs> on the way. Past. Yeah, I don't think we've done. Um, I think because we've always raced against each other um, and always been comp- like we're the same, like yeah. identical twins. We're genetically the same, um, environmentally very similar. We're always going to be very similar um, yeah. in our skills and stuff and abilities, and so we've always been. Um, compared, so as much as we are competitive against each other, it's not like a. Sort of a rivalry. negative rivalry yeah, you know and yeah. it's actually quite supportive and you can understand yeah. um how the other one's feeling etc at the same time it's always as much as you go oh it doesn't matter we both have good races it's still nice to be the one that's can say that from ahead <laughs> yeah and from behind and uh yeah I, I, you know i think it does make it difficult sometimes when you're or you've always got that comparison that yeah. of racing against each other we played a l- bit of tennis together um and when we used to play together in the club champs, it was, you know, the sidelines, nobody knew who to barrack for. Because yeah. you're just like, I can't barrack for one because I'll fa- show favouritism, like parents. So it was always a horrible match. Because <laughs> we've got the same strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, nobody seen- ever really wins. It's, oh, it's kind of that frustrating. Come to think of it, I'm thinking of like the Williams sisters. You never really see them play, each- like they play yeah. doubles together. You never see them play against each other. That's though, tr- yeah, they? They yeah, I'm, yeah, to think I'm sure of, they like, have a beer. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure they trained against yeah. each other and that's it. Well, just in competition, you probably wouldn't. Yeah, uh, and so you both qualified for the 2014 Kona. Uh, 2015 it's Kona, 20. we did. Um, yeah, she raced in Melbourne again and got a spot from there, and I raced Port Macquarie Ironman and got a spot from there. So um, that, that was must great. Have been an Parents came experience. across. Um, but my one of our best friends, she came across. So we had a ball. It was my first time racing there. Elizabeth had raced the two years 
two years ago or two years prior to that. At what point did Kona become a goal for you? Um, well, I think once, as soon as you do Ironman, you kind it's of think... It's the pinnacle, right? Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. And certainly for the first Ironman I did, it was all about getting through it and finishing it. Um, and then after that, you st- you're trying to not have it as your goal that you need to qualify or you want to qualify. Um, but it's certainly a nice bonus yeah. when you're up that sort of point to your end and yeah. you've got an opportunity. Um, and it is, it is amazing experience you know it's a good it's a bloody tough race yeah so <laughs> um, it's lumpy it's hot yeah it's, uh, so yeah. it's really hard and i think there's i've never seen during that race i've never seen so many explosions of people because they all think oh this is a world champs this is my chance this is today today is the day that i'm going to hold that extra two percent and it's hot and windy and humid and everyone's racing hard so you just see some spectacular explosions so i think just there was plenty of athletes out there on the day who should have who you know should beat me by a long way but just you know i just was like i've i've been over and watched it i know i'm gonna race smart and just get through it and not be a puddle at the end of the race so you're just on the run passing all these people that have just gone you know that have passed you on the bike way too fast and just exploding in spectacular ways it's just (laughs) oh so yeah definitely was happy just to to get through and to get through well and you know not have to be crying or yeah, <laughs> in a puddle yeah, somewhere, uh, crawling over the yeah, finish line. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and how did uh, so you? And that was once again you were both racing in the yeah, same year. Yeah, 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 yeah. She got me again in that year. <laughs> uh, I'll claim that she'd done it before, so she had a bit more experience. But no, time. it was yeah, pretty yeah. good. Yeah, and really good. Uh, and then so when did the adventure racing come in? So soon after that? Oh, uh, I think so. Well, bef- during that and before. I think we'd started a f- uh, both of us had probably started a few it was the, the paddle sort of race that from the murray that you did around that sort of time right was um it, yeah that marysville to melbourne was around that marysville same time i think um or similar you know maybe a little bit before the iron man um and there was lots of adventure races you know the we have australia's got a great series of a few 48 hour races so you could sort of do them on a weekend you could be training for your iron man or some of your longer triathlons and um slot in a race yeah. on the weekend because you could, you know, you can mix your training quite a bit yeah. for adventure racing, um, whereas you need to be a bit more yeah, consistent with really, Ironman. Yeah, so I think training for an Ironman is good for adventure racing, but training for adventure racing is isn't not, so good for an Ironman. Yeah. So that, that's what kind of puts me off Ironman is that it just the, the training on the road and uh, both on bike and on foot just puts me off it's yeah. um yeah it just becomes oh, were you doing a lot indoors on a train no or it no was all and outdoors yeah it? most of it outdoors and Melbourne's I'd, a great place to train yeah for, right? i don't I, I um don't enjoy or it's find it very hard to motivate yourself to run on a treadmill or to or sit on an ergo for long periods and the best thing about most of the ironmans or all the ironmans that i've done is that you've had a good group of people around you or some training partners that you can go on your long rides with and do long runs with and yeah, yeah most of it's done outside and I'm sort of a bit of a believer of um, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing and once okay. the hardest thing is getting out there but once you're out, it's much better than sitting on the ergo for so many hours or whatever. So yeah, that, seems, that seems tedious. It's yeah. a bit just, just do it but yeah, doing, certainly doing it with a group yeah. makes it a lot more enjoyable and it is really you're trying to pit your skills and fitness against others you know you you so predictable a little bit um you know you, you're sitting on numbers and you're trying to well, heart rate percentages and stuff yeah. you can go from that so that it's a good skill in itself yeah to be learning to, learning how to race and an them. amazing foundation to then actually go and start doing adventure racing it's right? great yeah. you, you just those long hours of training at lower intensities and just maintaining that is really good base for adventure racing where you just go and go and you know the difference with adventure racing is that you do have moments where it spikes a lot higher you know you can't sit at a designated heart rate for long times you've just you're going up and down sometimes you're going a lot higher and working really hard when you're going up a hill or faster but then you get some sort of recovery times when you're into transitions or you know going downhill so what what was your first expedition length adventure race? Oh, it was God's Quite, Own. God's Own. Yeah, which, um, for, yeah, it's one of the toughest. What or, year was that? Um, two thousand and 
16. Yeah. yeah, 2016 God Zone. So I think I'd just done Bustleton Ironman the year before. No, that was – oh, no, the Hawaiian Ironman. And then, yeah. yeah, in the year before. And it was oh, – I was petrified. I think I'd done – um, like some 48 hour races so I knew how to go through a, a night um, but I'd never had to sleep during a race um, or anything and God's Own is definitely one of the toughest races it's it's a full on adventure nothing's going to be easy there's no easy kilometres um, they, they intentionally just, make it oh, as hard as they possibly can it's amazing right? and New Zealand has the best terrain yeah. for adventure races. It's designed like there's no there's a, there's a reason that a lot of the, all the Kiwis are tough and good adventure races because their terrain on their doorstep is just adventure racing paradise. Yeah. So it, it and it lives up to its name. Like God's Own's amazing. It's just um, but amazingly tough. And I did it with three guys who um, had raced a lot. So as novice as I felt. I was super confident that they would know what to do and they were giving me lots of tips and do this and anything they said, I was like, yep, 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 got it, yep, 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 and just learnt heaps um, and it was amazing, like amazingly tough. I remember, I think there must have been 10 legs or something or in it. I remember on the third leg, it must have been about 43 hours in, it was some trek and I we hadn't slept at all yet, so we'll sleep monsters were coming in. It was the middle of the night. And we'll had about seven K down this four wheel drive track to the TA, which you could see the lights for, but they just weren't getting any closer. And my legs were shot, like quads just gone and you'd you know, just that gradual down. We'd been trekking on this trek leg for a day and a half or something. And I was just thinking, I feel like I'm at the end of an Ironman. Like, and this is like three <laughs> of <laughs> ten. What the hell? Like, oh. So, yeah, getting through that um, was a real eye-opener. You know, just having your first sleep in a race. It's like, oh, yeah, I get to sleep. Get, oh, go to sleep. Oh, you're too excited. Oh, go to sleep. So, yeah, that um, – I was definitely hooked. Yeah, so 2016, where was the, where was the race there? Uh, I was in Nelson. Okay. So Abel Tasman so National Park like and around of there. The South Island. Yeah, yeah, it was. Spe- what sort of distance was it that year? Oh, um, it I don't was know. Like it took us. So. Uh, the 10 day was the last, was last okay. year. I think it was a typical seven or eight day. Yeah. So we must have done it about five and a half or six days, I think. Um, I dislocated my shoulder on like the second last You're leg what, on, on the, the bike uh, on the bike leg was the second last leg I just unclipped on the wrong side and literally sort of this single track that was a bit wet just as dusk was coming in and you're tired because you're five days into this race or something um, and I fell down a, found a cliff grab, like stuck my arm up to grab a tree to stop myself falling and pop my were shoulder out were you stationary out. clipping out or uh, no, moving were, a little but yeah. just sort of that was all really rooty and slippery so I sort of unclipped her but just oh. missed it toppled off yeah dislocated my shoulder and I was lying there saying a few unsavoury words screaming just a little and Hugh and Josh came up to me as I was holding my arm screaming and I think Hugh took my arm to, so they could help take my pack off and it popped back in and I was like, oh, oh, that feels better. <laughs> oh. All right, well, let's tape it up. Let's keep going. And they were like really worried, but I was like, I've already done five days of this race. I am, there's no way we're not finishing. Like I've done this. Like, so yeah, I think, um, I walked my, or ran with my bike for a bit because I didn't want to, you know, while we're on the single track and then got back on and kind of the spasm kind of reduced over a bit of time and I was like, and oh. was it? Do you have a lot of technical riding after that? Um, so that there was a little bit more technical riding, which I sort of ran on and then the boys yeah. um, jumped ahead of me and were like, if anything was a bit dodgy, I said, tell me and I'll get off early so that I don't land on it again because I didn't really, that's what I didn't want to do. Um, and then... Yeah, by the time we got to the end of the bike, I must have had another four or five hours riding. It had kind of relaxed a little bit, you know, in that position. And then we had a six-hour kayak oh. to finish with a sprint finish in the end. And I How was the kayak with your... Did you, with well, to your start with, I think Hugh, who I was paddling with, um, he was a bit excited because he's like, oh, well, I'll get to go with Burn and get in a better boat because we had different boats. There was two types of boats that we'd used in the first kayak leg so he was like oh well he's a strong paddler he'll paddle with me 
and he'll get in a good boat, which would be comfortable. So he was kind of a bit relieved. And then when we realised that they we were going to both get the same good boats, yeah. the Barracudas, he was like, oh, now I'm in a boat with Bern and she can't paddle. <laughs> <laughs> Not and, so excited. And you couldn't paddle? But I, yeah, I could actually paddle. I started with just keeping my elbow right by my side and just yeah. sort of not doing much. Yeah, just, do, t- just paddling yeah. one side. Yeah, oh, uh, you could sort of get it in. And yeah, then yeah. after like an hour, you know, after a little while, it sort of warmed up and you're so numb from everything yeah. anyway that I could actually put in a decent stroke and get Have it going. Have you dislocated it again since? Because uh, normally if you do it once, it's yeah, prone to I've come out I've been lucky I haven't dislocated it again, but I've yeah. certainly... Um, had a couple of issues. Had a, like a few, like jarter or it gets a bit weak. Often I've sort of re-injured it a few little times. Just yes. um, normally when I'm going down rapids kayaking, I've, if I come out of my boat for some reason, I try to do that occasionally, <laughs> see if I'm better beside the boat or in the boat, and it's still better in the boat. But often, yeah, if I've, I've injured a couple of times, just being caught in rapids, um, just jarted a little bit more. So it's definitely my weaker shoulder. Yeah. Um, but with... If I keep the strengthening stuff up, then it yeah. survives right. So I've been pretty lucky. I didn't and need ha- any surgery How or did you finish up that year? Um, well, we finished. And I think we were just outside the top 10. Yeah. Um, how many competitors do they normally have? In? How many teams do they normally oh, have? Oh, God's own has God's like own. 50 to 70 teams. Yeah. I'm not sure yeah. how many were yeah, in it that year. Big. But it's big, yeah, big numbers. Um, and the Kiwis are just yeah, bloody tough. Can't they n- nobody's been able to beat them. Yeah. You know, a few have tried. International teams have tried. Um, no, no international team has ever won. No, yeah. no. There's a f- yeah. yeah. It's always yeah. been taken out by Kiwis. Yeah, and yeah. I think Chris Vaughan's won all but one of them. I think. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. Just, um, they're they're tough. Kiwis yeah, yeah. are Kiwis are a tough breed. Yeah, they're yeah. bloody good adventure races, and they've got amazing terrain to do it on. So yeah, yeah to beat them at their own game, I think although it would be good, they'd be very very heartbroken. Yeah, and what about in your own source? So the first uh, expedition adventure race, and we say expedition, they're normally always like b- between three and seven days, yeah. and sometimes up to ten. But what was um so after doing uh with the, after doing God's Own, were there any the Adventure Race World Series? So the XBD yeah. And so after the, um, I think after God's Own, the next one I did was Shoalhaven, which was the World Champs in, yes. in Aladulla, yeah, in yeah. or Shoalhaven in yep. 2017. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. So that was the same year. Yeah. So that you know, you go in at least knowing a little bit more what to expect, and we had a good race. There was quite a few Aussie teams around um and we were pipped by 10 seconds for first aussie team i think we came sixth and uh our mates were another team came fifth with the sprint your sister wasn't in that team no no (laughs) thank goodness Uh, (laughs) um yeah so we were sixth at that at the world champs that that year and were there some obviously kiwis and french Um, teams yeah the uh, seagate won it that year yeah um i think adventure medical kits came second I remember who came yeah. third, but yeah, yeah, so we did. We were super happy with that. Yeah, that yeah. That one, actually, my mate Paddy raced that one, and that's the kayak. There was a crazy kayak in that one, wasn't there? Like crazy seat. I mean, there always is. Oh, like, there, there was, was a, a good, super. Yeah, there was a was pack like, raft yeah. that went. So you in. You walked down to the the river, the Shoalhaven River, I think it was, um, and then you pack rafted for maybe seven hours, and then yeah. you transitioned straight to a kayak yeah. so i think we end up paddling for 15 hours straight like seven hours in a kayak and then uh, in the pack raft and then eight hours in a kayak and like sleep monsters like night two or three or something by then the sleep monsters and the crazy bits everyone swears along the shoalhaven river where they were pack rafting that there was all these carvings on the rocks yeah. which there wasn't but Classic you can talk to anyone and they're like oh yeah we've saw that one and everyone yeah. saw this boat up on the hills that definitely wasn't there it was a a real or not real yeah, situation I see graffiti and like yeah. getting into the second night so yeah same so that was carvings, just yeah. psychedelic because we started that kayak just as it was getting dark so you, you can't really stop because you're cold you're not gonna you just gotta get through it but oh nav in a kayak at night is just I find it so so difficult it just I, I get comp- so disorientated in the water yeah and like uh, yeah in the kayak it's really really tough yeah you've it? really got to stay on that bearing and things and I um, suppose I'm in a lucky position that um, I've raced a lot with Hugh and he's an amazing navigator so um, and I often don't do a lot of the navigating in races so he, yeah it's 
hut just which is great I'm yeah, happy but yeah. yeah they do an, he does an amazing amazing job it's, it's quite impressive but certainly yeah it's dark you can't see anything and you're trying to work out which bend you're on and is that a inlet there or a little stream that you're going through which yeah. in daylight is fine just in night you just forget to get through yeah and the sleep you know as soon as you sit in a kayak um it's just like rocking the you to sleep, sleep really yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you just oh, i'll just shut one eye oh maybe i'll shut the other oh look i'll just do both just for a bit and yeah you know you're trying to talk whatever you tell whatever stories you can to keep each other awake and oh yeah. it's just the, the team dynamic in adventure racing is right it's a bit i mean you've you've done trail walker a few times yeah. that's sort of how often people get into it and actually how i got into ultra running was um through doing um the sort of team of four yeah. um but it's a very interesting dynamic when you're out there for five days six days together like what what's your secrets for success in terms of uh, team look, dynamic? look i think yeah you definitely want to be racing with your mates you want to be racing with people that you get along with um, because when the shit hits a fan, <laughs> you want to be able to rely on the people around you and get on with them. And, you know, when you're tired and hungry and exhausted and lost and it's the middle of the night and, you know, you're cold, you, you're at your wits end. So it's really easy. Something, someone annoys you during, when, you're, when they're, you're not in that position um, then it's going to be really hard to get along. So it is a lot about communicating and making you sure you're all feeling. Um, so the team that I generally race with, sort of now Thunderbolt, um, we see each other. Three of us are in Melbourne, and yeah. one of us, and Hugh lives in Sydney. So we train a little bit. We train a bit together. Just yeah. you know, go on random races adventures or and road stuff. Or? Um, yeah, a few. We certainly race together yeah, a yeah. lot, and then um, yeah, there's there's a good community or a good group of you know a few different teams that we sort of all raced in various combinations um so we'll often race or uh, train together and go on adventures together yeah um, but i certainly still do a lot with my tri, a tri group or the, the tri group and yeah. um with others so it's not a bad thing that when you get to race you've actually got stuff to talk about yes yeah, um, yeah. And stories to tell that you were like, oh, oh, yeah, you were there for that one. Oh, do you yeah. remember? Th- oh, yeah, you were there for that as well. <laughs> so it is good to, that you've got other stuff to talk about and you're not sick of each other just already before you start. Um, you can wait for a few days in before you get sick of each other. So yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. When you get tired and well, stuff goes wrong, you don't feel like talking. So if you, can, um, if you understand each other well and their strengths and weaknesses, there's a lot that doesn't need to be said. You know, th- yeah. that's the beauty of racing with people that a bit, you know, a similar team or people that you know and that you're not finding out these things in the middle of the night. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're supposed to, when I get tired, I forget to eat. So somebody needs to tell me to eat, you know. Yeah, the, those little things that yeah. you only get after, like, yeah, racing together yeah. multiple times. And of, you can, uh, you know, you trust each other yeah. more and you sort of inherently slip into the roles of, you know, you know what you're strong at and what they're weak at and where you can help yeah, what, and how you fit I, I'm in. I'm interested in that, actually. What what do you see? Because that was one of the things when I raced XPD, it was my first expedition race, and I was like, I actually don't know what my role here is. I was um, kind of the kind of the donkey, the grunt yeah. man. Carry. I wasn't like we had the nav guy and then the co-nav and... Um, and then, the pack, you need a pack horse. And yeah. then I was the pack horse just carrying the ship. But then, um, yeah, I, I like, but then you also need the people to, some people would like to keep spirits up. Yeah. You know, there's a, what, yeah. what do you, what, what are the sort of key roles? Well, often I'm mandatory equipment. So, you yeah. know, I've got to be there, which is great uh, yeah. as, as a chick. Um, but no, I think I'm generally pretty good at uh, logistics and sort of being on top of what needs to go where and what we are you know what else needs to happen so yeah. like, like packing up the boxes yeah packing and up the sure boxes and, and the making sure sh- is in yeah right making sure we've got all the equipment and stuff and what's coming up and what we're going to have to do so that sort of strategy for things yeah. i'm not too bad at um yeah generally for me the first day is often tough because the guys are stronger or i want to be racing with stronger guys so they're often a bit faster than me certainly yeah. on the bike um while their testosterone's still going but after that first night and you know into the second day then i tend not to slow down as often yeah. chicks you know once the boys have burnt their testosterone off um then they sort of slow down a bit more than you'll slow down so I, you know by the end of the the race often I'm end up carrying more pack, carrying their packs as opposed to them carrying mine. Like yeah. That might have done the first days. Yeah, yeah, that um, makes sense. And yeah, I t- 
tend to go all right overnight, like you're without a physiotherapist sleep. as well, yeah. right? So I'm sure that's sort of like the first aid start. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> certainly got we've got that covered. Which often in adventure race, they're like, "Oh, this is sore." I'm like, "Oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, take a painkiller and keep going." Like, <laughs> <laughs> "Oh yeah, yeah, that's sort of yeah, yeah, all right, yep, keep going." <laughs> as, I'm, you know, I'm being as sympathetic as I can, but basically the answer is. Suck it up and keep going because yeah. we can't do much until you stop. Suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> certainly that kind of cover that off. But yeah, I suppose I do all right without sleep. Like I like my sleep, but I don't tend to get too many sleep monsters. So trying to keep everyone awake. Yeah. I've got a horrendous. Do you, do you try, sorry, you've got horrendous. I've got a horrendous repertoire of bad jokes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I tr- bring them out when we're trying to stay awake, and I'm sure that makes us go faster because they're trying to get away from them. But <laughs> the, the yeah, shanta, they don't get the, any the better. Shit banter, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we're just around sleeping. Do you train for sl- for sleep? That I I'm it's always like, do you do you do I, like through the night training to train yourself for sleep de- deprivation, or is it best just to get a lot of sleep and then you can put up with it? When yeah, you haven't got it? I, I think um, before I'd done any stuff through the night, I think f- like the first Oxfam trail walker, we did a few hikes overnight, you know, yeah. to practice with our lights and just to practice at night. I think we you know, did a few Friday nights after work. We'd go out for dinner and then train through the night so you had that fatigue as well. Um, and then once you've done, you know, so the first few times you're going through a night, so some of those 48-hour races where you're racing through a night without any sleep, um, I think once you've done that a few times and, you've, you know, you've ridden your bike at night or you've, um, you've got those things, then I don't think there's a lot of benefit in doing training sessions to go all night yeah. because it, it fatigues you, you can't do anything, you're a mess for the week, the sleep lack of sleep is really detrimental in terms of recovery and yeah. being able to back it up with training. So I don't tend to train through the night yeah. um, in preparation because I have done a few, I've done enough races now where I've done that. So I, I know what to expect and how my body's going to react and how your head's going to react and what things you need to do. So it's a good idea to prepare if you haven't done that before. Yeah. But I think from a training fitness point of view, it's there's no real advantage and you're best to have a long day training, get some sleep, get up in the morning and go again the next day. I think it can be, to your point, it's more of a psychological thing. Yeah. It's just knowing how to deal with that when you are in the middle of the night. It's like that time before dawn when it's 3 a.m. Yeah. And actually what you want to do is lie down. <laughs> but you've just got to push on through. And, yeah. Uh, um, and yeah, have have having done that a few times you know okay this is that time but it's going to go within an hour but like let's just push on through but uh but yeah if you haven't as you say if it's the first time you're doing these overnight races you might want to test it before the actual race but absolutely your experience i mean it's really it's no fun to do unless you're in a race (laughs) (laughs) unless you're around mates and there's a reason for doing it otherwise you know fighting the urge to sleep when you really could go to sleep yeah uh, it's really hard i put down my like my raving years in london back in the day as my like sleep deprivation (laughs) training like the 24 like the 48 hour benders at the weekend (laughs) Perfect adventure racing training, yeah. yeah. You, f- you know, you feel that drunk anyway at 3 a.m. in the morning on your second night. You feel pretty drunk. You may as well have had a few drinks, I suppose. It is like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, have you had any, uh, have you had any uh, DNFs when you've been adventure racing? Um, I think God's Own last year when um, we got to day six, I think, or five or six, and Josh... We were actually in relatively good shape in terms of, you know, a lot of people were having teams around us having trouble with their feet. It had been a really wet race and long and hard on feet. So we were doing quite well. But Josh, you know, suddenly got quite ill, vomiting and, um, you know, and, and diarrhea, quite severe. Had I you think. been from water? I think from the water at the top of maybe Percy's Pass or something, he'd grab w- some were water. Were you putting um, Yeah, we were definitely treating it all. And, uh, yeah. But he might have been, I think he was a bit hung- thirsty. I don't know. Just yeah. something, he'd, he when he came back to Australia, he found out he had Guardia. So he'd picked it up somewhere and it yeah. came on quite suddenly. Do you use a filter or like you do it just with chlorine? We just use drops. And, yeah, yeah, yeah chlorine yeah, drops. I think it's my, yeah. And just wait, you know, yeah. 10, 15 minutes minutes or whatever for it to set so yeah. I mean that had been a pretty it had been a tough race one of the legs leg three was a super long leg that had, I think it was three day leg almost and we'd run out of food so it'd been tough so I think by the time you get to day six it's just system can't tolerate that you know he yeah. Josh is a 
bloody tough guy. Yeah. Um, he'd raced a, a wildside expedition race the year before where he was sick and we dragged him around the course for a day and a half. And to his credit, like I, the state he was in, I can't believe he got he got through. So. Yeah, he just couldn't get off the ground. He couldn't stop throwing up. So that was the prior years. So you knew that we it knew, yeah, he, he could he, do it if he could, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that was probably the first. And and in that DNF. one, you couldn't um, you couldn't continue as a three. Yeah, we were on the we had a kayak leg to go, um, and so once we, we sort of waited at the TA for um, twenty four hours to see if he or to see if he was going to come good and hoping that you know a bit of a sleep would make you know maybe he'd get a bit better but he was not coming any good and that there was a short kayak leg um so you needed four people in the boats and there wasn't anyone coming behind us um for a bit and then we were into a track leg with no so yeah he couldn't yeah, yeah. he couldn't continue and once you've kind of stopped it's, it's really tough isn't it with um it's super with, a team, tough. with a team of four like one of you you because you feel a massive guilt about yeah. you're just ruining everyone else's especially you know, if it's something like Oxford trail walker people can continue whatever yeah. but in an adventure race that's it your team's out yeah, yeah and it's, uh, so yeah i mean it is it is tough yeah. Um, and yeah, you're gonna f- you feel bad. You, it's like an anticlimax to not finishing. But he's always gonna feel so much worse than anyone else. Yeah. But it is. It's part of the sport as well. You know, yeah. it's the good and, and that's the bad. Where it comes down to being like a really strong team dynamic yep. and being mates is like that. You just yeah. You, you roll and he's with that, always gonna beat himself up more than we ever. Like we're like, oh well, like stuff happens. It's annoying, but th- that it is what it is. Yeah. So, yeah. I th- think this his scars from being the one to put to dna to pull out yeah um are always worse but there's no blame you know it's just it's one of those things and you always hope it's not going to be you but potentially yeah. at some stage it's going to be you yeah yeah yeah. You know? yeah and and what other um part of the adventure race world series what other races have you have you done did you say you went to china did you do uh, the china i've done one ex- of the china um races then not the exterra not the um because the they did adventure a adventure racing world series one just one yeah. of the they did a trial one and then actually last year they like had to yeah. cancel on the start line i still don't know what happened there actually I don't yeah know if you know i think it just got scooter. quite um i think the political, political tensions around that area they were sort of advised not to and yeah. couldn't you know but their permits or something were revoked or something yeah, i think yeah. it was beyond their control really but the, the like test one they did the year before or two years before it looked amazing actually. yeah it looked absolutely stunning yeah it yeah. did look good um i haven't done that it does look a great place to race i've done a couple of the um stage racing in china like yeah. wulong where it's you know the four day stage racing where you go and you smack yourself silly in a team of four one day for you know five to eight hours and then you do it again the next day and then yeah. the next day and then the next day you know you just progressively start sore and sore and with more and more compression or bandages on to get through the days. so um that's super competitive what were the racing. names of those races right? um so i think i did uh i'm say it's wulong but it's um yeah there's there's a sort of series over there there's yeah. quite a lot of prize money so you get a lot of the prof- you know professional or semi-professional races um and adventure racing that do a lot of it over there yeah um there's most of it's stage racing so it might be two to four days yeah um i think there's one race that goes um over like a 24-hour type race yeah. um, but same same principle a bit of it bit of navigation some of it's marked um teams of four biking yeah. paddling there's often a you know a, a wheelbarrow carry or a some yeah, yeah, weird some china random random things um <laughs> like so they're a bit of fun or something yeah yeah <laughs> make some yeah so they're they're a bit of fun. smoking opium no no maybe not <laughs> that um but you, you didn't go to reunion island last year though no you, no? no uh that that race looked absolutely yeah. brutal i possible. follow a lot of my twin sister elizabeth raced um in her in with the tri adventure antelopes yeah. and yeah it was super brutal uh certainly know a few other people that raced it was pretty tough i mean it looked amazing it stunning, from a spectator point of view but i think yeah. it was certainly lots of vertical meters and lots of climbing gear and climbing that they needed to carry and, and do yeah so. and then like carrying the pack rafts for like the yeah. 120k first hike just look and everyone's feet got shredded straight yeah. away didn't they? yeah yeah and, I think and just there was like, a hiker bike for about 50k or yeah something i don't well, think there, there was a lot of rideable tracks on that sort of island there yeah. so yeah i mean that's a bit that's the 
amazing thing about adventure racing. It gets you to these places that you would never otherwise go. We went as a team to Expedition Africa two years ago. Oh, wow. Um, and it was amazing down at like South Africa, Cape St. Francis. You know, we just had a, an amazing time. We did super well, um, came second, but, you know, went on a safari, just saw some absolutely amazing places that you would never, you know, in the middle of the wilderness that you would never go to these places um even if you lived in the country a lot of the time so yeah. it certainly gets you to um yeah some experience some amazing things and actually on that you just got back from expedition india and there were uh how many teams were in the race there was about 20 I think it was 26 20? yeah 26, i think they had 26 yeah. 27 and actually teams quite a few indian teams as well yeah which was there? fantastic it yeah. was really good um i think they've had the most uh, they run maybe two other versions of this yep. this is the first year that it was officially in the um world series race um and yeah certainly they had the most indian teams this year so that was a really good for the local teams and in fact the african team like the uh, race directors were also race directing this with them as well weren't they? yeah so they um heidi and stefan who and run Stephen, um expedition africa they have run the last two um expedition indias so last year was a demonstration event yeah and then this year um it was in their world series yep. and they put on an amazing event they the court stefan sets an awesome course heidi looks after the competitors it's kind of a bit of an all-inclusive package they they're seriously professional and do it really well so they run a great event yeah. um i'd highly recommend their their events um i think india was always going to be a you know a destination race it's a cultural experience plus a you know up in the himalayas it's the definition of a destination yeah. race so it was absolutely amazing we went there a couple of days before and went down to taj mahal and saw the sights of delhi and you know got the culture shock a bit out of our system um got used to indian time and how things work um or don't work they just you know it'll <laughs> happen eventually point. so i'm sure i think some of the transitions i weren't sure if we were more stressed or the organizers were more stressed with just logistics and india time um but it, yeah it was it was just so different you know um it's an amazing place. The people are awesome. It's there's it's quite over you know it's overpopulated. It's a third world country. There's rubbish everywhere. Even in the Himalaya regions that you were. I, I was surprised actually how many still little villages and um, goat herders you'd see out in the middle of you know sort of nowhere. Whereas in a lot of other races and other places you just you wouldn't see anyone for days. Whereas you were still seeing people m- most of the race. You know, and you're going through lots of these little villages and and stuff so it i heard some yeah, great stories going. about people going and like staying in people's houses and stuff so along the super way. friendly yeah. so we like everyone that you passed was you know namaste hi like they were just amazingly friendly yeah lots of people when they were a bit sick or had you know gone in to stay with different people or they'd welcome them in we were trying to find this path up to the temple which was a bit of a it was a marked track or drawn on track on the map and we were we're up there sort of at night and the checkpoint at the bottom was missing so we were we kind of we knew we were in the right spot but it was like had a little doubt and the track got quite sketchy so we'd sort of gone up and down a few times and it got more sketchy we weren't sure if it should have been a a path or just a way through anyway we sort of slept down the bottom there but we must have gone up past this guy's house like three or four times and his dogs kept barking so all night plus he'd probably had teens like before us and teens coming after us and yet when we passed him the next morning you know for the whatever time he's like hi no you know namaste and oh somebody left this behind so yeah everyone was just like the just so friendly and welcoming and probably looking at us going what what the hell are you doing yeah, yeah. <laughs> um well, uh, apparently the maps were pretty tough to decipher. That, yeah, so Hugh again was navving for us, and we had a couple of couple of nav errors. But I think the maps are super busy. It's a developing country, so you know the maps, the roads have changed. Um, there's lots of roads that aren't marked on a map. Um, there's local village, you know, roads routes that the villagers use to get between. So I think you had to use a bit of um imagination and yeah. you know well there like should be a track there should be a track between these there aren't two any tracks yeah. There, yeah so it was super hard nav yeah. um 
and like hats off to him like he did a great job um I definitely wouldn't want to be the one you know having the soul map and being you know the person responsible for that so I think um we might have made a bit of a a detour on one of the legs that we caught up with the dark zone that he's you know was annoyed about but it gosh yeah to just do just have that error was pretty good so it was quite challenging um for the maps and yeah so most teams you know some of the best navigators were all getting a bit lost and wandering around and yeah so it was pretty good yeah but and it started high up in the Himalaya what what elevation we started about 2200 I think okay um and sort of stayed around there the highest we got to was just under 3000 um up to a temple and we're sort of up and down a bit from there And finished at about 2,200 as well, I think, in Shimla. Okay. So I started in Manali and finished in Shimla. So yeah, it looked pretty cold, though. Of, yeah, I think it wasn't until two week, two months before the race. So we'd seen all the promo shots. We're signed up going, yep, Himalayas, India, tick, tick, yep, let's go. Like, And all the promo shots they'd done in summer. So they're in shorts and a T-shirt, <laughs> rafting and mountain biking. The sun's out. It's super green. And we're like, this is going to be awesome. Awesome. And then about two months before the race, like two months ago, we're getting these reports that, and checking going, guys, there's snow. Like, there's a lot of snow there. Like, still, um, it's going to be really cold. So we invested in dry suits for the oh, rafting because we were like, it's really cold. So it just all of a sudden changed my mindset to, I didn't think it was going to be cold. Oh, my God, it's going to be cold. Oh, so it was, it was like we were up through snow and it was yeah. cold, but not as we were lucky that there wasn't a lot of rain or, yeah, yeah. or snow. They'd had if some big dumps snowing, of snow hot, like the hot. week before and rain and lots of landslides that caused a few headaches for logistics and the course it might have been yeah. changed a little bit. Um, but it, yeah, it was, yeah, a lot colder than I was expecting, and, yeah. but not as high. They'd gone quite high the year before up to 4,000 or 5,000 even yeah, and so decimated the, the field. To play with. Um, so, yeah, I think even even at that first trek when we were going up to close to 3,000, I wasn't feeling super great, yeah. but it wasn't super altitude. You know you're going to be dropping soon yeah. after. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and it was the a couple, the French teams that came. Was it two French teams that yeah, came? Yeah, they did really well. Yeah, really yep, strong. Nature, uh, Nature X yeah. um, sort of went away with it from early on there was another French team that came into second so yeah. the uh, blackouts make a huge difference though don't they when you get to uh, along the rivers where you you have to um, camp along yeah. the side of the rivers along so the, the way it changes yeah yeah the rafting the second rafting leg we'd all kind of seen the logistics planner and worked out that you were going to be really hard pressed to not get caught in that and it was going to likely bunch up the field. So we were anticipating that we'd get in there sort of in the evening, get a decent, like get a most of a night's sleep and then all sort of have a bit of a restart. You can use it to bank up sleep. Yeah, and as as it turned out, we got a little bit lost on our trek, did a bit of a detour. So we um, only got a couple of hours sleep on the court out on course and then got to the start of the rafting just in time to sort of catch up with the rest of the the top i think we were, must have been in eighth position back by then i, I think yeah. um and so we the dark zone that we thought we'd get lots of sleep in we only got a couple of hours but then the raftings the rafts weren't there because they yeah. the you know the driver had had a nap or something <laughs> so they were a bit late That's so the right, start like was a Stephane bit late and Heidi might just been like, oh, <laughs> just throw, yeah they did an amazing job i think yeah. and he just it is you what it is. It's India. It. Yeah, exactly. And it's adventure racing, right? Yeah. You just expect whatever. You yeah, I mean, you're, do not with gonna, that. you're not going to start same for complaining. Everyone. No, Everyone's they the did a really good job of managing that and organising that. So then, um, yeah, we had a couple of extra hours. So we might have had three or four hours sleep as opposed to some of the others who had seven or eight. But it At that of, stage, it doesn't make a not, massive not, amount yeah, of difference. Yeah, like almost no. you're going, well, seven or eight hours is almost too much. Yeah. You know, or is a luxury to have. Yeah. So that can't, the dark zone worked well for us because we thought it and then yeah, where did you finish up. up in the end we finished in sixth okay solid yeah, yeah yeah so that was not bad i uh the last trek sort of got quite sick got the full india experience oh and did you the deli belly got the deli belly you. caught me up so i just like uh, i'll have uh fond fond or not so fond memories of you know, hopefully the that wasn't in the dry suit no oh, thank goodness <laughs> we did we did unfortunately pass one team who on the rafting who were 
with one guy trying to get out of the dry suit to, to do just that. And he, I think, later filled that dry suit. Um, but that wasn't so pleasant. But, yeah, luckily for me, it was just – it was on a track – on the track. And so we had about 2,200-metre climb up to this temple to get up to about 2,800. And I'd thrown up and had diarrhoea at the bottom. So the whole way up, I was kind of on tow with – it was the boys taking my pack and just feeling, just filling my pants and oh. like going, oh, just go, you know. And you kind of in your head going, I know my mind will quit before my body does, like will give in, but my mind really feels like quitting right about now. <laughs> so yeah, I. And you got through like, Was it a twenty-four hour thing or? Ah, uh, well, I was sort of still. I think for that sort of twenty-four hour period, I'd had maybe a couple of wine Emodium. gums and a little bit of a oh. wrap and a lot of emodium and yeah. oh, nothing really worked. And I'd, look, by the time I we had that trek to finish, and then the bike leg, um, which I was starting to able to eat a little bit and just a bit of you know stomach cramps and stuff. So yeah. It wasn't pretty. I was glad to get to the end. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> For you sure. Were, had, and the, did you manage to stomach the pizza? Did you get pizza at the finish line? Uh, That's a classic. They had some, no, curry. It's oh, in it's India, curry, right? It's curry. Yeah, Breakfast, yeah. lunch and dinner. Yeah, like, yeah. Just so it's an extra curry. thing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah pizza would have been nice but no uh, <laughs> I couldn't really I think um, that's, it's taken me uh, the boys did super well they got a bit sick after the race yeah um, there's lots of teams getting sick it's, you know you've got to be so careful with the water with and the water, I probably yeah, just you were picking up water on course or were they most going? of it was uh, they yeah, had bottled water in transitions yeah that's um, good yeah and then we'd treat any water that we yeah, need yeah. to pick up on, on route you I think just maybe careful. when we were rafting it might have got a bit of splash yeah. that it's got in the mouth and uh, who knows what it was I think that was kind of it so I even uh, yeah, everyone was a bit average afterwards and yeah. flying home. So I lost a few more kilos than I w- would care to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so certainly on the build up burn after yeah, after well, India, that's the good thing about you can, yeah, the putting it back on is the best bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's t- it took a good week or so before I could really, Stop you know, it. until I was back in Australia before I started to really load up. But I'm making up for lost time now. Yeah, so. yeah. What have yeah. you uh, What have you got lined up, Burn? What's in the uh, in the the calendar for the rest of the 2019 oh, and into 2020? Well, uh, they just re- launched the XBD dates for they have July for, for next year, yeah. so that's exciting. And we did hear as well about um, the Expedition Africa guys that were over there with their 10 year anniversaries next year for Expedition Africa. So I think that might be a good one as well. Yeah. But yeah, um, XPD would be sounds awesome next year. Um, this year, there's a few local, the A1 series, a couple of local races coming up, sort of the Queen's Birthday Weekend GeoQuest is uh, on the calendar, and then we're sort of... The se- Queen's Birthday GeoQuest, what date's that? Uh, so June, the June, our June long weekend. Oh, so I should know, early. it's our Queen as yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the dates in different countries are <laughs> okay. the same, but yeah... Uh, Early. Yeah, doesn't she have two birthdays? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's un- her actual birthday anyway. Uh, yeah, June, early June uh, yeah. is a 48 hour race. Uh, in Queensland or? Um, it's in New South Wales, I think, Yamba this year. Okay. It's always on that sort of New South Wales coast. Um, so we'll do that as a team. And then, yeah, Sri Lanka is on this year. Yeah. Um, are, are at the you, Worlds. Uh, and there's also up? Eco Challenge. Yes. So have you got a team? They haven't. They haven't really announced teams so officially you've replied, yet. Though. But we've, yeah, we. Uh, I think we've got a got a. Might be good to have a team. Might be yeah. busy. I might, I might be busy in September, uh, in yeah. Fiji. Um, so we're just yeah waiting on a few more yeah. press are, releases are, are you, and stuff. Are you signed up for Sri Lanka? Uh, not yet. So I th- okay. yeah, as I said, I think um, I'll be racing in Eco Challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, so d- probably with my sister in a team. Okay. Um, so the be two good. of you in a team together, yeah. Because you don't know, often don't race together, right? No, no. So, so you're in an all-female team. Um, no, two guys. Two yeah, guys so two awesome. guys, two girls. So it should be. That'll be that'll, that'll be, be so cool. pretty cool. So the, uh, and this is one of the things I want to talk to you about is that like adventure racing seems to be taking a bit of a resurgence at the moment. Yeah. I don't know whether it's just because I've truly got into it over the last few years, but um, obviously it's been around. Like Eco Challenge has been going for like... Yeah, so they haven't had... So Eco Challenge has just come back this year. Mark Burnett and Bear Grylls are bringing it back with Amazon, I think. Um, yeah. I think it's been 20 years since they last 
had one, so they're yeah. bringing it back this year. Uh, I know certainly lots of teams have applied. It's a bit of a casting application, so I think um, racing with my sister, the twin thing, might have got us good enter, you know, in, yeah. into it. Yeah. Um, but that'll be a lot of fun with uh, Leo and Sloshy um, in our I team. Are you Sloshy, are you cool? yeah, yeah, so yeah. that will have a lot of fun. It'll yeah. be interesting to see how it goes and to bring it back because it's you raced 20 Fiji years. Like, I like no, I used to live, I lived for a couple of years in Fiji when I was little, um, like when I was five to seven, our family was over there, but no, I haven't, um, haven't raced what, there, but they've, what would it be like as a place to race? I, oh, I think, I mean, I think be tough to it's going to be jungle. Yeah. Um, it's eco challenge and it's for TV. So they're not going to make it easy. Yeah. Like they're going to want to break you. That's going to be good TV. It's not going to be good TV if you're just like, oh, yeah, that was really fun. Yeah, yeah, we loved it. We had they so much time. They're going to want to see people, in the, want to see people in the paint. Yeah, <laughs> they're going to want to break you. Bear grills, so maybe we'll have to eat some random stuff. I'm, gonna, I'm sure we're going to have to build our own boat to get you're to some have to island. Drink and they're not going to like, <laughs> It's not going to be. It's going to be one of those races that every adventure racer wants to be in it, but if you're in it, you like don't want to be in it. Yeah, right? get so, out of here, yeah. Uh, Oh, oh, I think that's amazing. So it's like going home to you for you a little well, bit. As well, yeah, a little you bit. Spent, uh, I think. Spent some time growing up. So there. yeah, so I'd love Sri Lanka. Look, Sri Lanka's up on my bucket list of just destinations oh, to go to. So, so when they announced it was there, I was like, oh, I'm in. Put me in. So we'll just sort of see if that works yeah. out as well. Because that and you know, would be Craig pretty will awesome. get an amazing, oh, amazing. He's got a great event. team around him. Yeah. Craig and Louise always put on a. Fantastic, yeah. solid race, well organised. You know, I, details I've heard are really so good. So much about. I've never been myself, but I've heard so much about it as a destination, just yeah. for holidaying, for trail yep. running, for mountain biking around there. And so I'm pretty sure. And they've got some decent elevation. It's yeah, gonna, it would be it's gonna awesome. Be yeah, it would, it's definitely on the list. So yeah, we haven't quite worked out what's going to happen for the rest of the year because that does sound like it would be absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. do you fund it all? How do you, do, do, like obviously well, you're your sponsor to us. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> that's much That's why I work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, there's worse things to spend money on. Uh, yeah. Adventure racing is my hobby. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so mostly yeah, it's that's... sort of self-funded. And we've been lucky enough to get Aussie Grit um, on yeah. board with Thunderbolt and they sort of, their clothing and stuff, you know, we've trialed a lot of their stuff is amazing. Yeah. It's super good quality, super durable, super comfortable. And you help them with product um, development as well? Yeah, or? we've done a bit of that, you know, yeah. testing some different stuff and trialing it out and giving them a bit what of feedback and what things. Are their, what are their So specialties? outdoor gear. But what, um, what are, so, what's the best gear? Uh, like they do bike nicks and jackets. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, running and bike riding or mountain biking is there. Um, in in the outdoors, like adventure type yeah, stuff, yeah. so it works super well. Yeah. Um, for us, it is yeah super super comfy and super good. Yeah. Um, and we've tried to trash a lot of it, but it it stands up, <laughs> yeah, so that's really given, good. You put it through its test. Um, yeah. And uh, and so you're a physiotherapist uh, by uh, were you a th- physiotherapist in in UK as yeah, well? Yeah, yeah. So I um, studied studied here physio and from um, from school. Went yeah. to uni straight into physio. Um, and yeah, love it. Yeah, I yeah. Um, work mostly, w- or I work with neuro patients, so people who have had strokes or um, brain tumors or head in- MS or head injuries. That's sort of my area of specialty. So I work in a hospital, a f- hospital a few days in rehab, and then I have my own practice a couple of days in yeah. neuro rehab. Um, and I love it. I love working with people, um, being able to help them in their, you know, some of their the toughest time or whatever yeah, but it's yeah. good it's good developing that rapport and being able to to help them you know much better doing something rather than sitting at a desk yeah that's amazing but my um, um yeah i've been ex- my father had a really bad stroke and everything last year and just oh, seeing yeah. this ph- a physiotherapist the amount that they invest to try and uh, yeah, help someone be able to to get that brain elasticity yeah. and just be able to to get better and get moving again. It's uh, it must be a really rewarding. Uh, yeah, it's role. great. Like I I love it. It puts a lot of things into perspective. Like I'm very fortunate and lucky that I can go out for a run and a ride and adventure race and do lots of things. Um, and I'm always grateful for that. And you know, seeing someone who has who's had a stroke and can no longer sit up or stand it definitely puts things into perspective and you know reinforces how lucky you are um so then to be able to help someone in that 
time and work with them, um, give them just as much grief as I'd give anyone else. Yeah, you know, yeah. Pour into <laughs> as, my team as to get going. Your yeah, yeah. So no, it's good. I'm in a very lucky position where I love what I do. Yeah. Um, which is just as well, and my workplace, and you know, are pretty good in terms of giving me leave to to do a lot of races and stuff. So yeah, that's cool. Good. And that's the biggest thing as well, having that flexibility of going. Hey, by the way, I'm off for two weeks. Yeah, is that yeah. Cool? And I but think like, working for you, I work for myself for a yeah. couple of days, so that's handy because my boss on those days is amazingly understandable when I want to take time off. Yeah, <laughs> and I also think that I mean, wherever you work, it will help. But you know, yeah. you could build brand for them as well, and. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a it, yeah, it's good to work at a flexible place. Um I've got a few quick fire questions for you yep. to finish up burn. So, uh what what makes you emotional? Um oh, that's a, that's a tough one. Cuz you seem uh, like really uh I, I don't think it would take a lot to rock you. you yeah, well, I don't know, in the middle of the night when I've been going uphill for god knows how long and I really want to stop, it probably wouldn't take as much to make me cry. But I um <laughs> Yeah, I think seeing, I'm in a health profession, I suppose, but seeing yeah. either other people or certainly family and friends um, upset or in pain um, certainly really chokes chokes me up um, and gets me feeling feeling emotional. Um, but yeah, t- you know, I'm generally pretty happy-go-lucky and yeah. take things in my stride most yeah. of the time. Have you got any books that have been really inspirational for you? Um, I reckon I've read a few really t- books in a very timely fashion. So I think I maybe before one of my first marathons, I read Paula Radcliffe's book. Um, before maybe the, some of the Ironmans, I read Chrissy Wellington's, you know, To Fire You Up. I've just done Coast to Coast in New Zealand. I read Steve Gurney's book about that. So yeah, I do yeah, like yeah. a good biography about, you know, they do tend to inspire you and you can relate, especially if you're about to do the same kind of thing that they've done. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I reckon they're the... Yeah, how did uh, like you did... You got top ten in coast to coast yeah, recently. I like they're a, going from a side point here. But. Yeah, loved it. Um, it's, it's such an iconic race. And you did it in the because the, you can either do it like a, as a stage race or or in a yeah. You can do it as a two day race. Yeah. Um, or you can do it in the one day, the longest day. So the elite. Um, and yeah, it's quite tight. And, and it's it's on South those, Island from. Yeah, it goes a, from um across like at Christchurch it finishes in, at the beach at Christchurch yeah. and starts in Greymouth so you're sort of going across the um, from west to east um, yeah. and it's a road it's, bike trail it's a, run yeah plan. you have a road bike uh, a short little run a sprint really because you're going for a, from the beach you sprint a couple of k's to get on the bo- road bike and that road bike you sprint because it's a pack ride the first one or you can ride in a pack so yeah. you're kind of sprinting to get onto a pack you have a 55k road bike and then you've got a um a mountain run yeah. uh 35k mountain run or 33k mountain run up and over goats pass which is super technical running up a riverbed r- super rocky and then you have a 15k road bike then a 70k whitewater kayak down the Waimak River, which is so spectacular, just amazing. And then you, yeah, road bike um, time trial into Christchurch, sort of 70k's to the finish. So um, it's the world multi-sport champs, I suppose. It's super iconic. I think if you're into anything adventure racing in New Zealand, it's a rite of passage. Yeah, yeah, um, it's, 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 it's part of the bucket list. That yeah, has to so it's definitely a bucket list event for me. My sister did it last year and I support crewed and there was no way that I was never going to do it. Yeah. Not not do it this year. Um, Does she support crew you? Yeah, it was. Yeah, you course, had to. Yeah. It was yeah, like yeah, part yeah, of the yeah. deal, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's how it works. I just thought she might, she could have been like, <laughs> oh, no, I'm on holiday that week. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, yeah, it was great. Loved, I loved, smiled the whole race. It's spectacular. It's iconic. You're racing against the best of the best. So yeah. I was super happy to, you know, to come away in top 10, um, yeah, and happy with the yeah, race. It's uh, the, again the Kiwis who get to train on it every day. A good, um, it was good to be able to go across there a couple of times and recce the course a couple of times. Yeah, because um, that's really useful. But it's is, is self nav. Um, um, the course is marked, it's marked. effectively. Yeah. Um, or it's so, a it's a known trail. It's a well marked uh, trail. It's, or? it's the run. They will mark it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And. It's just good to go over there because it's so technical. Um, rock hopping and running, there's no, we don't have a place like that in Australia to train. Yeah, so it's yeah. good to do that. And the kayak, um, again, we don't have that type of whitewater 
here in yeah. Australia um, that you can practice on. So it's good just to try the kayak out that you're going to paddle and just to know some of how to read the river and pick the right braids. Um, it's useful because the water was actually quite low for us this year. And yeah. so early on there was a fair bit of boot scooting yeah. your kayak across rocks and trying to pick the right braid that didn't run out of water and, you know, yeah, yeah. to get back into the main flow. So um, uh, iconic, amazing, smiled the whole day, loved it would you know do it again in a heartbeat yeah very cool and I, I need to read steve gurney's book there do you know what it's called i can search it out but like it's uh but it's it's specifically about coast to coast yeah, coast, is, oh, it, it, he, he is an adventure race athlete and multi-sport racer and he yeah. um is one of you know has won coast to coast a ridiculous number of times and has yeah. raced it a, a ridiculous number of times so he's yeah iconically coast to coast but he's done a lot of other races he's yeah, done so some is expedition it all, is it, is it racing autobiography and stuff. though so it's, it's yeah it's an autobiography so yeah. it was I, I and he's, he's, a, he's a good larrikin um yeah. i've met him a couple of times like a pioneer and the coast to coast like you know a few play he's just he's a good bloke he's yeah pretty um down to earth he's got some pretty good stories oh, um sure. so yeah it's you know he's a bit of a, I'm a novel inventor of, um, so. of gurney goo as well yeah. Yeah, like i um and actually like one of the questions i asked you in a minute is like of, of top going for ask you now but like top gear that you've bought for under 100 bucks mm. um and i've had a few people that we've interviewed say like gurney goo is yeah. like one of their best bit of kit but what's your uh, best bit of kit for under 100 bucks well i suppose on the good yeah it's definitely something i, I was gonna say um you know some socks or something that i've you know, i've got these socks that i've worn what? quite a few times just i don't know where you know got them off wiggle some dhb socks whatever they're pretty good but i think um pseudo cream is my number one yeah. thing and you just paste it feet yeah yeah it, but everywhere yeah. um i would not race without it so yeah pseudo cream or gurney goose you know yeah, it's yeah, of yeah. a similar substance i've certainly done um a couple of super wet races i remember one the GeoQuest week race, which is on in June, which is coming up um, a couple of years ago, was so wet. So from the start, I pretty much covered myself in pseudo cream because I knew that I was just going to be wet for the entire thing. So back, arms, legs, butt, feet, just and it just stops those up. blisters. It just stops yeah, any, just like, it's a little bit of a waterproof barrier, a little bit of zinc, so it's sort of antibacterial. Um, yeah, and friction. You know, you often say you know in any sort of racing or adventure racing you don't really want to be stopping you want to just do everything on the run but there's always time to stop for to yeah. lube up and to, you're always to allowed if you've got the, a hot spot the one thing that's going to really stop you is going to be some stupid little blister yeah, yeah. so yeah so pseudo cream's my go-to for that are there any uh, are there any podcasts that you listen to i don't know if you're uh, you consume podcast content yeah i do i company. do consume podcasts like like there's quite a f- i'm not but i quite like the serial podcasts yeah yeah um you know the about crime and some good stories but the american america's life and yeah the serial this american are an life excellent, is really good yeah, an yeah. excellent one um i do listen to some of the um like fitter radio podcasts but they're a lot about the, the triathletes and i'm in and um fitter radio is fitter that, ra- yeah, is it's that a, an aussie it's a kiwi it's a kiwi is it yeah, yeah. Um, so that's quite interesting. They're up into all the research on sports science and training yeah. and a lot of athletes around, um, a lot of triathletes around in different, doing different races. So that's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, there's a, you know, TA1 Adventure, is an adventure Racing podcast that talked to some interesting guys. So that's... Today 1? TA1. TA1. Yeah. So okay, Randy yeah. Erickson um, takes that one. So he yeah, yeah. speaks to a lot of the adventure races. So sometimes it's good after a race to hear other stories you know you're reading race reports or checking on facebook and what's happening but he'll speak to get yeah. some sort of hands-on stories yeah um so yeah and we'll see what yeah it's good cool. to hear other stories of what other people are doing yeah yeah t1 I'll, I'll check that out as well and um and what is i love to ask this question i actually when like in the business world i always ask this whenever i'm interviewing people to come work with me for me or in, for our businesses what's your proudest uh both personal and professional moment of your life so what's the thing well, that you think, look back on and most I proud think of professionally i'm pretty l- lucky in that i there's a few different patients that stick in my mind about yeah. achievements that we've wor- I've worked with them to help achieve, and they're real often tearjerker moments when, you know, they're tell, tell me you about know, one with of them. happy. Just oh, I remember seeing this lady in the UK who had been just discharged from hospital after a, quite a severe stroke, basically set up in a um, hospital bed at home, um, and 
that was it. Like, you know, she was that thought that's where she was. And she was quite, you know, young, like 50s, I think. And I just remember seeing her over a period of a couple of months and she was bed bound when I saw her. But I think she just had never been given that opportunity for rehab. So being able to get her up and in the end she was, you know, able to walk and get out to a car with her husband and go out and just have those moments um, where of for her she thought her life was going one way and that was it and being able to get, um, work with her to enable her to you know change that path and so there's I'm quite lucky in that there's often a lot of those patients that stick in my mind where I have been able to you know they've suffered some catastrophic event um, but to be able to help them you know it's it literally does elicit tears of joy. Yeah, I can um, actually see you getting like, quite emotional amazing. thinking about so it now. So it's really good. Amazing. You work with them, you develop, you know, you get to know them quite well. So that's, for me, I'm very yeah, lucky. What a great that profession that's to work in. Something you can, that like, I get to do. Properly change people's lives. Yeah. Um, and personally, I think, you know, every um, big race that you've done, that f- finish line feeling when you're, you know, coast to coast, uh, crossing the finish line in, you know, in a God zone or, uh, you know, some of those, my f- in that first expedition race, you know, God zone and or crossing the finish line at the first Ironman or Hawaii. It's just that feeling when you cross the finish line and you've had a, you know, a decent race and you just, like, all this, all the work that you've put in and all the um, nerves and the worry and the anxiety and the pain that you've, the mental pain that you've gone through during the race to keep going, keep going, don't quit, don't quit, keep going. It's just that, it's unbelievable, like ecstasy, that feeling at the finish line. And yeah, even when you think about it, you're like, yeah, that's what. Hairs on the back of the yeah, neck stuff, isn't it? it really it's does. So I think the the more scared you are by a race, the bigger, the better, and the harder that it's been during, yeah. often the better, the better the feeling is at the finish. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Thanks, Ben. And it's <clears throat> adventure racing. I think is just such an amazing, amazing sport that takes us back to uh, the just really. It's, it puts you through the toughest. Um, it puts you through the mill. It's the most. It's difficult. I think sport and actually getting getting females into the sport mm. is a real real challenge oh, not a challenge but uh, I think people go well why would I want to be out there for six days and so um what uh, yeah what, what are your ideas about getting more more women into the sort of expedition adventure racing and what are your I suppose advice for um um for anyone any, yeah well I think um I think sport, yeah, women in sport in general is certainly increasing. Um, and, I mean, the same for men. I think maybe amongst um, women it's less uh, accepted that, they, you know, they or less challenged to do some of those activities. Um, but I think when I was hearing about, you know, doing a race for six days and not sleeping, uh, I was like, what? Why? Like, it just seems stupid. And I think um, the same as an Ironman. When you first hear about it, you think, oh, that's impossible. I'm never going to be able to do that. Um, And so seeing people doing it, so watching that first Ironman and seeing the elite runners to Joe Blow doing it and, you know, the people at the back going, oh, well, actually, anyone can do it. So I think the more coverage that's getting out there to see people doing it like role models um yeah. of f- other females racing and having fun or or, or not having fun but doing it <laughs> um and having enjoy fun at the finish line. having fun at the finish line <laughs> um i think the more that you see them you kind of realize oh well they're actually they are just a bit they are like me it is yeah. doable um because it wasn't you know once you're doing it it, it is achievable you know yeah. it seems like these un- uh, these unachievable events a lot of people do do them and they survive um, and have a lot of fun doing it. So, yeah, the more that I hear about and see all these people doing other events is the more that I want to do that. And so um, that enthusiasm, I think, is infectious to the people around you. So if you're exposed to that, um, that's... 
Yeah, and I think that's, uh, you know, well, it's, Endurance Asia is all about ordinary people achieving yeah. extraordinary feats. Yeah. And, and when you can, you see people like that, you think, actually, yeah, no, I can do that yeah. too. And I think that's um, one of the reasons I was so pleased to be able to share your story as yeah. well, is that, like, you know, you're like anyone can actually just go out there and try and start absolutely and give it a go and yeah. um, from just doing your original few triathlons and then actually I'm, I'm sure your sister had a big part of it of you two competing with each other but just seeing those women thinking if they can do it I can yeah and it and it very much is like that I think um it takes all abilities to be you know to do it um whether you're doing it faster or, you know, taking the shortest amount of days or the longest amount of days, I think the beauty of it is you're out there with your mates yeah. and you're having fun in the bush. Like, yeah, that's, yeah. it's pretty good. You can go at different paces, but, yeah, it is such an amazing and experience. Actually, when um, I did XPD last year and your sister um, and your sister and the team, they smashed it yeah. and won it and then they they were there watching the final people get yeah. over the finish line and yeah. that's the great thing is that the actually the cheering the last people to yeah. finish a race is they almost you look at like UTMB or any of these big races like ultra marathons like everyone's there cheering the last yeah. people to get over as much as the first yeah. people yeah. and that's I mean for me I'm always out there like I take I really enjoy support crewing or just being out there and seeing other people race so um that that motivates me and gets me excited just being amongst it so that's yeah. you know as we were talking about before when you're if you're support crewing or just getting involved it does motivate you to give it a try and because you do see that it's quite achievable um yeah, yeah. Bern, it's been brilliant. Thank you so much for making the time. No I'm, worries, uh, thank yeah, you. Um, I'm really excited to see how you get on at Eco <laughs> Challenge. I know there's, they've not announced the places, but that's going to be a, a brilliant show. I think adventure racing is one of those sports that if they could find a way to, to really, I think social media has given it a way to be able to people yeah. follow a lot better and obviously dot watching. But if there was a way to true, I mean, I, I've been thinking about like, you know, following with, um, with drones and stuff yeah. and just being able to make it a really accessible sport to be yep. able to spectator um i i think that there's but that there's this sport's going to go huge over the next yeah. five to ten the years the stories that come out of it you know i i just take my gopro out on course and just get little snippets of bits and, and pieces as she's going but um yeah it, it, there's the potential is amazing because the stories for each that each team comes back often the best time after an expedition race is those few days when you're catching up with your other teams are finishing and you're just swapping stories about did you remember did you this happen to you you know or did that happen or what happened um people were at the course during the night whereas you were there at the day so you just get to swap stories um, and they're hilarious. Like you would not believe the stuff that goes on out in the course. So it's yeah, it's like yeah. proper war stories, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's yep. like you're all yeah, out there. Yeah, for sure. War. Um, and so yeah I, I, I hope you guys get a slot in that and, uh, and really uh, look forward to following it on the, what channel is it going to be on is it Amazon I you think say? yeah it's Amazon, Amazon that are running it and oh. then uh, and then yeah I, I hope you find it in your diary to get in the world champs yeah, in Sri Lanka as well I'm hoping to be there actually as yeah. a, a just a, I'm not racing but yeah. just as um, yeah to kind of crew and to be a support fingers crossed like I need to yeah but um, awesome be, uh, yeah well that's the like there. destination Plus, so that should be good. Yeah, it looks amazing. Burn, thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. The Endurance Asia podcast. I know we tell a truthful story if they ever ask. Stop the complaining because things ain't that bad. Things ain't that bad. Things ain't that bad.